What's up everybody, my name is Zach Pascarello and in this video I'm going to teach you how to categorize transactions. This video is for anybody and everybody who wants to start and grow a bookkeeping business. I have had a bookkeeping business for three years. I've done bookkeeping for over 100 small business owners. So my goal is to teach you everything that I know so that you can start and grow a successful business the exact same way I did. I always tell people doing bookkeeping is a three-step process. First, you need to categorize transactions, you need to reconcile accounts, and then finally, you need to generate financial statements. This video is going to be all about that first step, categorizing transactions, and we are going to focus on how to do that. And primarily, we are going to look at this concept of chart of accounts. So it's kind of a difficult concept to really understand theoretically. So I'm just going to put it in practical real life terms, because like I said, I've done bookkeeping for over 100 small business owners. I have seen thousands of different types of categories and chart of accounts. So I'm going to share my experience and my knowledge with you so that you can learn best practice. Okay. So what are the chart of accounts? The chart of accounts are basically any category that you would use to classify a transaction and these categories show up on financial statements like the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement. So your chart of accounts are just individual categories. So anytime you see chart of accounts, just think categories. How am I going to categorize this transaction? And there's two main types of categories. We have balance sheet chart of accounts and we have profit and loss chart of accounts. I'm going to use the word category and the phrase chart of accounts interchangeably. So anytime you hear chart of accounts, think category. Anytime you hear me say category, think chart of accounts. Okay, so anytime you hear category, that just means chart of accounts. And we have two main types of categories, balance sheet categories and profit and loss categories. I'm gonna go over balance sheet first just because there's fewer of them, but the balance sheet categories, in my opinion, are actually a little bit more difficult to conceptualize because on the balance sheet, we have assets, liabilities, and equity. So we have assets, liabilities, and equity on the balance sheet for the chart of accounts or categories. So typically what we see for assets, we would see things like cash. We would see things like accounts receivable. We would see things like vehicle or building. So these transactions happen not very frequently. It's not very often that we purchase a new vehicle or purchase a new building. So categorizing things as a bookkeeper and using an asset or a liability or an equity as a category is not going to happen very often, but usually whenever it does happen, it's a pretty important transaction. So anytime you see a, a client of yours spending a large sum of money, they are probably purchasing an asset. Anything that's more than like two or $3,000 is probably a piece of equipment, an expensive piece of software or a vehicle or a building. So those are assets. And then another way that you can categorize an asset, this is the last one we'll talk about, is a security deposit. So a lot of my real estate investors have security deposits. They'll spend, they'll write a thousand dollar check and it'll go to some law firm or some broker or some real estate agent and it will be a security deposit because they are purchasing a house. So that's not an expense, that's an asset that's going towards the purchase of a house as a security deposit, that's an asset. And then moving on to liabilities, there are also security deposits that are liabilities. And a lot of my real estate investors also have security deposits that are liabilities. And that's typically, if you receive $500, that would be a security deposit as a liability because probably you just got a new tenant for a new property and they are giving you a $500 down payment or a $500 security deposit. And that needs to be paid back to that tenant after they successfully move out of that property. So security deposits can be an asset or a liability depending on if you receive the money or if you're spending the money and who gave it to you or who you are giving it to. Okay, so other liabilities, we have here accounts payable, opposite of accounts receivable. And then we also have, this is getting a little bit, a little bit too crowded. Okay, that looks a lot better. So for liabilities, we have loans and payroll. So these are probably the two most common liabilities that we're going to be categorizing whenever we are categorizing our client's transactions. So if they receive money, that's probably a loan. So a lot of people get a line of credit and they'll receive, I don't know, $50,000 from a bank or some funding company, and that should be categorized as a loan 
or a line of credit or a note payable. So if your client is receiving a large sum of money, that's probably a loan. Or the other thing that happens, and this will require a journal entry, and without getting too complicated too quickly, we'll do a journal entry and we will have debits and credits. And so what will happen with this journal entry here is they will receive an asset. So we have here, let's just say vehicle and loan. So let's say they took out a loan to purchase a vehicle and that vehicle was $50,000. So for the debit vehicle, 50,000 and for the credit loan, 50,000. So if you're a bookkeeper, you need to know how to do journal entries and you need to know, understand debits and credits. So with this loan, with the $50,000 loan, we're crediting the loan account. So we're increasing the loan account. We're debiting the vehicle, increasing the debit, increasing the asset of the vehicle by $50,000. So you might receive cash. So if you're receiving $50,000 cash, instead of a vehicle here, it'll, it'll be cash. So we're going to debit cash or debit the checking account or debit the savings account debit $50,000, credit $50,000 for the loan. This is what it looks like to receive money or receive an asset in the form of a loan. Now payroll, this happens. Once again, this is gonna be a journal entry. I'll try to clean this up a little bit. This is gonna be another journal entry for payroll. So we have here, so typically we have a payroll expense. I'm gonna abbreviate payroll PR, payroll expense PR, I don't know, liability, LBL. So we have the payroll expense of $100 and then a payroll liability of $100. So this is a little bit more complicated, but this is a journal entry for payroll expense and payroll liability. And this liability is, so let's say you pay your, your employees and you have payroll wages that you're paying out. So you have a $100 expense of payroll tax and then you have a $100 liability because you owe either the state or the federal government, you owe this $100 in the form of a payroll tax. So you haven't paid it yet, but the expense has been incurred. So these are two common types of liabilities. And this is actually really, really complicated. I didn't really want to get into this right now, but this is just a simple abbreviated version showing you debits and credits, a journal entry, how to account for liabilities. Because liabilities, as you can see, can get very complicated very quickly. And the last thing I'll show you how to close this out. So you incur this expense in real time and then you have a liability. And then whenever you pay the government, whenever you pay your payroll taxes, this is no longer. So we need to cancel out this liability. So this is no longer a credit to the liability. Now we are debiting the payroll liability for $100. We're getting rid of that liability and then we are spending $100 of cash or we're spending $100 out of our checking account. So this is how we cancel out the liability. So we increase the liability with a $100 credit and then we decrease the liability with a $100 debit. If you are brand new to bookkeeping, this is probably way over your head. Let me just tell you, you should take an intro to accounting class so you can learn the basics of debits and credits and journal entries and liabilities and assets because as you can see, this stuff gets really, really complicated really quickly. And this isn't even really what I wanted to talk about. In this video, I wanna talk primarily on income and expenses for your chart of accounts and your categories because that's what you are going to spend the majority of your time doing. So if this first five minutes went way over your head with assets and liabilities, don't worry. I recommend you take a course on intro to accounting. But last thing I'm gonna talk about for balance sheet is equity and this is going to segue perfectly into income and expenses. So the last categories that we have for equity and if you're a bookkeeper using QuickBooks, you're going to see owners pay anytime the business owner writes himself a check or does an ACH direct deposit to his personal account, that's owner's pay. And then we have the opposite, owner's investment. So anytime your client puts money into his business checking account from his personal account, that needs to be owner's investment. It cannot be sales. It could be a liability, but chances are it's just owner's investment. So if I'm brand new, I'm starting a trucking company, I'm gonna put $10,000 of my personal money into my business account so that I can start my company. That's not income, that doesn't need to be taxed because it's already been taxed once. So it's owner's investment, that's an equity transaction. And then we have retained earnings, which that's a, also a pretty complicated concept. I'm not gonna to go too far into it, but if you look at your client's balance sheet in QuickBooks, you will see retained earnings, and that's simply their net income from the previous year. So if they made $100,000 last year, you're going to see retained earnings this year of $100,000. And then finally, we have net income. Net income is just like retained earnings, but it's for the current year. So if they made $100,000 last year, 
their their balance sheet would have had zero for retained earnings because they just started their business and it would have had $100,000 for net income. Now this year, we lose the net income and the $100,000 rolls into retained earnings. And now we've made $20,000. So now we have 20,000 of net income, 100,000 of retained earnings, and then whatever they're paying themselves or whatever money they have put into their business. So these are the four most common equity transactions. And now we're going to segue into net income. I'm going to tell you the different categories that make up net income. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about P&L, profit and loss, income statement categories. We're going to start at the top because that just makes the most sense to me. We have income at the top. Some people, you can categorize things. Some people just call it revenue. Some people call it sales. Some people actually call it income. Some people call it services. Or some people have even more specific stuff. Like maybe they'll have income dash repairs. Or maybe they'll have sales dash construction. Maybe they're a construction company or maybe they do repairs and they'll have like these specific categories, income repairs, sales, construction. Or maybe they'll have, maybe they're a real estate investor. Maybe they'll have tenants. And so maybe they'll have rental income. All of this is pretty much the same thing. It's all just money they're receiving for services or products they provided, income, revenue, sales, services, income repairs, sales, construction, rental income. It's all the same thing. It's all just money that they received from their clients or customers. So income is generally pretty simple. Okay, now let's talk about expenses. This is the last thing we're gonna talk about, but this is the, the bulk, this is the majority of what you're gonna be doing as a bookkeeper. Okay, so the IRS says that expenses should be necessary and they should be ordinary. What does that mean? Nobody knows. What does that mean? Everybody kind of knows. It's a huge gray area. Nobody really knows what it means. But at the same time, everybody kind of understands what it means. It just means that they should be necessary for what you're doing and they should be ordinary. So for example, an easy example to understand is that if I, like you don't need to be spending money on lavish meals for clients or customers. Like if you're going out to eat and spending thousands and thousands of dollars, that's probably not an ordinary expense. Another example, so, for necessary. So if I have a bookkeeping business and if I buy a treadmill, that's probably not a necessary expense for my bookkeeping business. But if I am a gym owner and I buy a treadmill, that's probably a necessary and an ordinary business expense. So you can buy things differently for different businesses and they can be considered an expense for one business, but not necessarily an expense for another business. Okay, so now let's get talking about specific categories because I have people asking me all the time, like, how do I categorize this? Or like, can you set up my chart of accounts for my, my, my QuickBooks? And the one thing I will tell you, don't necessarily get too focused on starting and setting up a complete list of chart of accounts for your QuickBooks. If anything, I would recommend just develop your chart of accounts as your business grows. So in the very beginning, you're not going to be spending as much money as you would be spending in three, in three or four years. So don't worry about having a complete finalized chart of accounts in your QuickBooks. Just as you start spending money different places here and there, then you can add chart of accounts to your QuickBooks that makes sense with where you're spending money. So I'm gonna go through a list probably alphabetically, and here are just some common examples of expenses. Advertising and marketing. So if you're using Indeed or ZipRecruiter to hire employees, that would be advertising and marketing. Or if you're paying for Facebook ads or Google ads, advertising and marketing. If you put a brochure in a magazine, advertising and marketing. If you pay for a billboard on the side of the road, advertising and marketing. If you buy business cards, advertising and marketing. Auto, truck, car, etc. So if you are buying gas for your, your work vehicle, if you get if you go to AutoZone and get headlights for your vehicle, or if you take your work truck to get new tires or to get an oil change, that would all be considered auto, truck, and car expense. You can name it whatever you want. Um, you can differentiate between, you can have auto fuel, auto repairs. I, I like to keep things as simple as possible. So if I'm categorizing things for my vehicle, I'm just going to lump it all together, unless you have a trucking company, in which case, you know, you probably want to have a little bit more detail. You might want to break it down, fuel repairs, vehicle registration. So if you take your vehicle to PennDOT or to your de Department of Transportation, get a registration, that would be considered auto truck or car expense, name it whatever you want, as long as it looks something like, you know, it could be automobile expense or vehicle and car or truck and car, 
as long as it makes sense to you. Okay, bank charges and fees. So a lot of banks charge you $5 every single month as a service charge. A lot of banks charge you $15 for a wire transfer. That would be a bank charge and fee. Or if you go to an ATM and they charge you $2.50 for an ATM fee, I would say that's a bank charge and fee. Okay, next we have licenses, permits, and fees so like if you are a general contractor and you have to get a, a building permit that would be a permit if you have a trucking company and you need to get your vehicle registered that might be vehicle registration or that might be license permits and fees if you have to pay some sort of annual llc registration fee to register your business that might be a license permit and fee this is a very miscellaneous and broad category but a lot of times i find that if like i don't have a category for anything else and it's just like some miscellaneous registration fee or permit fee it usually goes in this category okay now we have cogs supplies so cost of goods sold are really only for if you have like inventory and raw materials but i do see a lot of people referring to cogs supplies as like their direct costs so for example if you are if you run like events and you have you put on production then maybe if you are buying like lights and cameras and just general event supplies for the event that you're planning that might be a direct cost you might consider that to be cogs or supplies if you're a general contractor and you're buying supplies from lowe's or home depot like wood and nails and drywall that might be cogs supplies like direct cost but typically like if you're a manufacturer they use cogs like nobody else really should be using cogs technically but i see a lot of business owners using cogs supplies as like direct cost that goes into producing their services or their products. But in manufacturing, it makes the most sense. Like if I were to be making, if I were to be building this whiteboard right here, like the cost of goods sold would literally be like this metal and this material and, and like these little things up here, like this would be the raw materials going into making the final product. Like literally the cost of goods that I'm selling in my product. But a lot of people use COGS as like I said, indirect or direct cost for just whatever service or product they're providing. Okay, contractors, so this would be for labor. Um, contractors, like if you hire any independent contractor, for me, I have a bookkeeping business. So if I hire somebody to do data entry or to do categorization or bookkeeping for me, I might consider them to be a contractor. Or if I hire somebody to do sales for me, I could still probably consider them to be a, co a contractor. I see contractors, I see contract labor, I see subcontractor expense, anything with like the contractor name in it would be anybody who's doing providing services for you. So general contractors might hire like subcontractors underneath them to help them perform labor. Um, my wife, she has like an interior design and like a home organizing business. So if she hires people to do the work for her and like go to houses and organize people's kitchens and bathrooms and pantries for them, that would be a contractor. If you have a trucking company and you hire drivers to drive your trucks, that would be a contractor. And I'm pretty much out of time right now. I have a much longer list of chart of accounts that I'm gonna go through. I'm probably gonna have to make a second video tomorrow. So this video is going to be to be continued. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent with the balance sheet transactions and the journal entries. I know that might've been a little bit over your head. If not, great, but I'm going to continue talking about these chart of accounts and these categories tomorrow in my next video, so stay tuned.